Hey, Crossbridge, good to see you, right? Happy Easter. And isn't it good to be in the room celebrating together as well as online and uh, at Peru as well. I'm thankful that we get to celebrate Easter together. And uh, aren't you? So, yeah. I also want to say Easter is always a time where there's first time guests. And, um, and I mean it when I say it, whether it's your first time online with us, whether you're at Peru for the first time or Ottawa for the first time, we are truly like, it's our honor and privilege that you would come and give us a chance like to worship with us and to celebrate Easter with us. So, uh, uh I, I'm, I'm grateful for you. And I love when new people show up and experience us for the first time. And, um, Hey, how many of you, um, as you watched the news this week, followed the story of the Suez Canal? Anyone? Right? A pretty big story, wasn't it? And, uh, and I, was, I was thankful when that barge ship busted loose, right, finally. They said it was partially due to um, kind of like going with the tides, right, as well as lots of tugboats pulling on that thing. They said when it busted loose, all those tugboats were blowing their horns, right, celebrating. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen that? Um, but here's, here's one of the things I was thinking about this week. Can you imagine the guy who was driving that boat? <laughs> I mean, at the moment, that thing started to go sideways. And he's like, no, 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 no. Right? Imagine with me. You know that's what's going on. And, and all of a sudden, it gets sideways. And it sticks in the, in the sense in the mud, right? And he's probably going, uh-oh, right? It's a bad day. And, uh, and then imagine when he picks up, I picture him picking up like a little CB thing, right? And, and going, I got to call my boss, right? Hey, I got a little problem. Like, I think I just caused a global problem, <laughs> right? And, and I, I just, uh, you know, I, I didn't see like they revealed who it was, but I felt sorry for that individual. You know, it, it reminded me um, as I was reading the story in Mark chapter 16, and I'm so glad we got to read the book of Mark together. Um, many of you Crossbridgers, we've been reading the book of Mark leading up to Easter. And as I was reading the Easter story out of the book of Mark, chapter 16, um, this, that, that story came to mind. And, and it came to mind because as, as I was reading it, um, we have two ladies in this story. Two ladies, one named Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the mother of James, going to the tomb with spices to be applied to the body of Jesus, a custom then. And a conversation happens about a stone that stands in the way. And it's a stone that these two ladies, as they're talking about it, they see a stone that to them is immovable. The same as 400 ships backed up said about the ship. It's immovable, right? And, and I thought to myself, like, this is, this is a great story. And so listen to verses 2 and 3, and it's going to kind of walk us through this story. Here's what it says. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. And on the way there, they were asking each other, listen to this question, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance of the tomb? I actually, I, I love that question. Who will roll away for us this massive stone? Uh, and, and as I'm kind of just listening in on that conversation between these two ladies. We get the privilege of doing that, right, as we read the passage. And, um, and, and I was thinking about the one thing here. It would be this. I don't think when they got there, they were anticipating that the stone was going to be moved. I don't think they were anticipating that Jesus wasn't going to be there. They wouldn't have been bringing their spices. You even say, what are they bringing spices for, Kevin? Like, what was this about? And really what it was about was as the body would decompose, there would be an odor and so they were bringing spices to be applied to Jesus in a sense to help his body to smell better. You know, it was a nice thing they were doing, right? They were, they were filling a role. They had a job to do. And as they were coming, they were talking about how are we going to do it because of this large stone that stands in the way. And in fact, it, it goes on to say after I, that passage I just read to you, it says that the stone is very large. Now, just time out for a second. As I was reading this story, here's what came to mind for me. I thought this is a really good place to recognize in our own lives, right? Just as these ladies were recognizing this large stone that stood in the way. I think a really like authentic place to be is to recognize the things that may be in your life 
that you have wandered into a campus or you've wandered online and you're engaging with us, and maybe just for a moment you would think about, is there anything in your life that seems immovable? Is there anything that you would be asking the question, who in the world can help me to move this? I think that's a really good question to ask. You know, one of the worst phone calls we can get, right? I'm just going to say it. I think you'll agree with me. The worst text or the worst phone call you can get is when a friend asks you, can you help me move? (laughs) Would you agree? And how often are you like, oh, I hope I have something on the calendar, right? (laughs) I hope I do. And then the second worst thing, though, is when you actually show up to help that friend move and you discover they have a piano, (laughs) right? Because here's the thing about pianos. I mean, a couch can be kind of heavy, a table could be heavy, but there's nothing like a piano. And, and I've never seen anyone just grab a piano and put it on their back and walk it out, right? There's always, it's like two people on the front, two people on the back, little baby steps, right? And somebody like hurts their back. And pianos are a big deal. Burn those things, right? <laughs> Sorry if you love pianos, but when it comes to moving them, they should just stay with the house. But here's what I know, right? The reason that people call and ask for help is because things like pianos, they're immovable on our own. We have to have help. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, are anticipating that they're going to need help. What are those places in your life that without help are dead and immovable? I was reminded a few weeks ago, you remember we had the, we had the snow here in Ottawa and uh, snow upon snow and freezing, right? Just kept, kept piling up. It wouldn't melt, right? You remember that? Anyone? Yeah. Maybe it's just in my house, but yes, right? It was mounting up. And, and um, one day I got a phone call from my son and he says, oh, dad, I just hit a snowbank, right? Which I told him not to pull in the drive because there wasn't enough room. But he's like, I just pulled in there for just a second. And as I was trying to get out, he hit the front of the car on this giant snowbank, right? And so I said, well, Gerald, how bad is it? And he said, dad, it's bad. Like, it's bad. And so I, I'm, I'm, I can hear it in his voice, you know? And so I'm driving home and I'm kind of trying to picture it. I get home, he's still standing outside staring at it. So I get out of the car and I stand there and stare at it with him, right? <laughs> and, and then he's like, he, he asked them the, the question. And the question is this, Dad, how much is that going to cost? And, and I was like, this is a good teachable moment, right? And so I was like, Gerald, um, however much you're thinking in your head, multiply it by two. Because <laughs> it's always more than you think. Like when it comes to like body work on the car, right? Isn't that the truth? Like, it's always more than you think. It's always more complicated than you think. And, and so I was like, Gerald, like, I'm guessing, like, you might be thinking $500. I bet that's 1000 Not to be the bearer of bad news, buddy, but that's 1000 And I know, what he's got in his, I know what he's got in his savings account, and I could just see him going, oh, that's a lot of hours at Farm and Fleet, right? <laughs> and, and so we were looking at it, and then he's like, well, can I still drive it? And I said, well, I don't know, so why don't you get in it, start it up, and, and I'm going to listen to you, like, go back and forth a little bit. We'll see if the tire is going to rub. And so he did. Nothing rubbed. And I was like, yep, just go ahead and go to work. There's nothing we can do about it anyway tonight. Take it to work. So he goes to work. Um, I'm laying in bed about 930 at night. He comes home. He walks in my bedroom. And he's like, Dad, you're not going to believe it. And I said, what are you talking about, buddy? What am I not going to believe? He said, it's not there. And I was like, what's not there? He said, the car, like it was all dented in on the front, it's not there. And I said, Gerald. <laughs> I mean, I know he doesn't want to spend the money, but seriously, buddy, you know? And so he said, Dad, I came out of Pharma Fleet. I went, I went right to it. I looked, it wasn't there. And he said, so I walked to the other side because I thought maybe I'm not remembering the right side. And I looked and it wasn't there. And I really, I, I thought maybe he had a problem, you know, and... <laughs> And so I said to him, I said to him, Gerald, um, just go to bed. We'll look at it tomorrow. So I walked out the next day and I walked out to the car and I was like, it's, it's not there. <laughs> I, I am still a little bit amazed, but my guess is that the plastic and the cold, I don't know, like that thing just popped out and I don't know how it did it. And, and I said to Gerald, I said, Gerald, you should thank Jesus, <laughs> Right. Yeah, right? But, but here's what I want you to think about, right? 
You know, I'm sure there's many of us that are here. There'll be people here worshiping online, worshiping in Peru, worshiping in Ottawa. You know, there's eight different services across the weekend. There will be people who show up and you're still in that moment where you're looking at something going, there is no way that could ever change. There is no way that's fixable. There is no way that's movable. And here's what I just want to tell you in the midst of this story. In fact, this story is miraculous because when they show up at the tomb, he isn't there. Like what they expected isn't there. Like he, he is gone. And here's what I want to tell you about your circumstance. Maybe you have cashed out on hope long, a long time ago, but I just hope that you'll listen to this story and you'll let, you'll let the Spirit speak to your heart and remind you that there is still hope that something can change. Because that's what this story is all about. It's about stones that are moved and dead people that come to life and things that can be changed and people who can be transformed. And it's all wrapped up right here in this story. It says in Matthew chapter 16, verse four, this is the moment, right? As they arrived, they look up and they saw that the stone, which was large, had been rolled aside. I love that part of the story. Now, there's an assumption here in the midst of this that Mark is kind of making as he's writing that we recognize that God moved it. In fact, Matthew's account, who wrote about this same story, he said, right, that this angel moved it and then sat on it. So we, we know there's an assumption here. In fact, it goes on in verses 5 and 6. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. I love this moment. I love when in this scripture where it says, don't be alarmed, seriously. They showed up with spices. They showed up expecting to see a stone. They get there. The giant stone is removed. They walk in. There's someone sitting in there who says, oh, it's okay. He's just not here. I mean, really, don't be alarmed. I guarantee you they were alarmed. I guarantee you they were shocked. But here's what we know, right? Hindsight is always 20 20. Well, we've heard this story before, but for them, I mean, they're in there and in the moment they've come with their spices and they're ready and they're like, where is the body? And he's like, he's not here. And, and imagine what must have been going through these ladies' minds. But here's what I wonder. I wonder that they're in this shocked moment. They're in this alarmed kind of moment. But I wonder, at that point, do they begin to recall some of the words that Jesus said? And, and if you look back, even through the book of Mark, which we just read together, if you look at the earlier accounts right before this, we see three different times. If you look at verse, in chapter 8, verse 31, listen to this. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law, that he would be killed. Now catch this part. But three days later, he would rise from the dead. So he's telling them, right? Now, Mark chapter 9, just a little bit later, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He'll be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. And in chapter 10, listen, he said, we're going to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. They'll sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Yeah, I wonder if in these ladies' minds they're like, oh, do you, now, now, now it makes sense. When we didn't really understand what was going on, but now it makes sense. We heard him. He said it back here, and he said it back here, and he said it back here. He said it three different times. And and now, maybe we shouldn't be alarmed because what he said is true. And then it says in verse 7, the same story, right? Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. See, without the resurrection, this would have, I mean, this is, it was just a good story about a good man who did incredible things and his life would have been taken too early. But that's not this story. It's a different kind of story. 
It's a different kind of story that has real power that's foretold and real power that is visible when the moment they walk in to the empty tomb. See, looking ahead, and here's what I found myself thinking about. That when they even say, hey, just know Jesus is going out in front of you, looking ahead, if, if, if they could put together, and I believe they probably were, if they could put together, man, what he said is true. He predicted it and it happened. In fact, he predicted it three times and it happened. And if what he said is true about this, what else did he say that is true? Because now all of a sudden, I guarantee you, they're all like, what else did he say? Because if he could do this, what can't he do? He is who he said he was. Now, so I was thinking about some of those promises around the resurrection that go before us. And and the first one is this, as Jesus moved from death to life, so can you. Hear that? that, that's a promise that is found in the resurrection. That as Jesus moved from death to life, so can you. John chapter 11 says this, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me, I love this line, will never die. I just received a phone call about a week ago from a family who had a loved one who was transitioning from here to eternity. And I went over there about 11 o'clock at night and I stood around that bed and I prayed with the family. And I'll tell you, those are very humbling places because those are the places where it causes us to think and it causes us to remember and it causes us to stand. And, and that's where our faith becomes real that we recognize this faith we talk about, this faith that I challenge, this is the moment where this individual is going to realize it because they are leaving this world. But according to what Jesus says, when we believe in him, we don't die. We never die. We continue to live with him in his presence. And that's an incredible promise. You know, as a kid, that's what I thought about a lot. When it came to my relationship with Jesus, you know what I thought about? I just thought, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, anybody as a kid? Yeah, I mean, it was just, how do I stay out of that place? So I'd ask Jesus into my heart every single week at church, right? And I just hoped that if I died, it would be on Sunday when we drove home, right? (laughs) Because I had a fear of Monday through Saturday, it might not go well for me. But I'll tell you, that's how I saw salvation. I saw it as it was this get out of hell card. But here's the bigger promise that's wrapped up in the resurrection. And listen, it's this promise for new life. Not that starts when we die, but a new life that starts right now. It starts right now. And it means that we live differently, following someone different than ourselves picturing our life wrapped up in Jesus, living the way he's called us to live according to his scripture. See, think about this. Even this, the fact that your sins can be forgiven in a moment, in one prayer, in a moment. That's why he came, to set you free from your sin. That all you'd have to do is bow your head and, and if your heart truly believes in him and if your heart truly would say, I'm sorry and I'm turning from my sin, that he could forgive you like that. There's a scripture that puts it this way and it says this, but if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. He will wipe it all away. And then I love this next passage that says this in 2 Corinthians. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And that's not at death, that is now. It's now. I can look around this room and I can tell you, even over my last eight years here, I see people and I can tell you their old life is gone and I've witnessed them living the new one. I've seen it. Transformation, change. They become different people because of the promises of Jesus and what is all wrapped up right here in this resurrection. 
And then the third thing that just was so obvious to me in this story around resurrection and promises that that we can believe to be true is this, that the power that was displayed in the empty tomb was not only for Jesus, but it is for you too. It's not just power to be read in a story that we would visit once a year and we'd go, wow, that was cool. Like Jesus had some real power going on there. But, but this story it is for you and it is for me. And, and what Jesus was saying is when you get wrapped up in my life and you lay down your life, just as I laid down mine, and just as I came out of this tomb with new life, you can come out with new life as well. And the same power that is wrapped up in that resurrection is available to you for the living of a different kind of life than you've been living. That with Jesus' power, you can do things and live in ways which you could never do on your own. That's this story. I'm reminded there's a, there's a guy named Paul who wrote a lot of words in the New Testament. And he says something like this. He says it in a little letter to this church. He says, I want to know Christ. And I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Like he's saying, I want to know that power. I want it to be in me. And he goes on to say, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I love Paul's heart in those words, because what he's saying is, I want to be so wrapped up in this Jesus story that that it just kind of takes on and forms and shapes my life as I pursue him. You know, I'm reminded, so this weekend, this weekend we will have at our physical campuses, we'll have eight services and we will baptize 19 people planned baptisms, right? 19, yeah. And, And when I think about the resurrection, I can't think of a better day to be baptized than Easter. Because here's what we're saying. We're saying that this story isn't just for observation from a ways away. We're saying that those folks who step into the water are saying, I want to be wrapped up in this story. I want to share in his power of the resurrection. I want to see it in my life. And, And picture it with me, that as people go down into the water, what they're really saying is, just as Jesus went down into the grave, my life, my old life is going in the grave. It is going away. I am putting it behind me and I'm trusting just as I love when you, and you'll see it here in a little bit, when we pull people out of the water and the water just kind of comes over their face and their hair peels back, you know, I love it. This is my favorite thing to do as a pastor. Because here's the picture. The picture is even when that water rushes over us, it's this reminder that Jesus cleanses us perfectly clean that he leaves all that sin in the past and it's forever forgiven and gone. And as we come up and we're washed clean and we begin to get out of that water, here's here's what we're saying is just as Jesus came out of the tomb and that power moved that stone and that power brought him back to life, that same power will help me to live this life that I've just committed to live. There's nothing better. And I'm just telling you. In fact, here's what I hope you see. I hope you see in the midst of the people who will be baptized and the stories that you will hear that this story and the power in it, oh, it's not just here in the Bible. That story is very real today. And the death and resurrection is wrapped up in in our folks who are experiencing him in fresh new ways, that he's doing powerful new kinds of work, that he's making people new and he's given them power to live. And, and I just, you know, the sad truth is we, we, we emphasize this so much on Easter Sunday, but the truth is every Sunday is Easter. Every Sunday is Easter because the gospel and the power in it isn't just available one Sunday a year. It's available every day of the year when we cry out to him. Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you've wandered into this place 
and you would say, Kevin, I've got some things in my life that seem immovable, that seem absolutely dead. But as you've spoken, I've sensed the Spirit speaking to me in a way which says, there is truly hope. And so I want to lean into him. I want to lean in him. I want to trust that that same power that was available, that same power that I just heard in that story of this resurrection is available to me as well and that God can do a new work in me, that he can forgive me of my sins, that he can make me new and he can give me power to live when I walk out of this place. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are. If you know he's speaking to you, raise your hand. Yep, I see that hand. Yep, that hand. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Father, help us today. The first step is for us to come to you and just to admit there are things that we can't fix on our own. There's things we can't move on our own and that we need you. We need the power in this story. We want to know your resurrection power. So God, we come and we confess our sins to you. We confess our need for you. We ask, Lord, that you would breathe new life in us. We ask that you would take the same power that was all wrapped up in this story and that we would sense it in our life, helping us to live in a different kind of way. God, we're hungry for it, but we know without you, we're in trouble. We never pull this off on our own. God, we need you. So I pray that for our people today, for those hands that are raised. I pray that as they cry out to you, Lord, you will meet them. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.